Hi friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Bethany and on this channel we talk about the false beliefs taught to women inside the church and we also shine a light on problematic Christian influencers, which is always a lot of fun. So if any of that resonates with you, go ahead and like this video, share it with a friend, follow me over here on Instagram. Oh, always remember to hit the notification bell so you'll be notified every single time I drop a new video. And don't forget to sign up for the Outspoken X Bundy newsletter so you can receive videos 12 to 24 hours early before they go public. Today, we actually have a church chat video, one that we have not done in a very long time where I just sit down with you and talk church stuff. So I asked y'all the other day if you wanted me to do a video of my deconstruction journey and it was a resounding yes. So I'm going to sit down today. I have my notes here to my right, your left. So if I'm working, working, Jesus, if I'm looking over here, I just have an outline. So I try not to get off track. So here we go. Let's get into my deconstruction journey. I never thought this particular moment was a part of my deconstruction journey, but now that I'm, I don't want to say completely out of it, but now I'm more of aerial view looking down upon it. I can see that this is where I started really asking questions and realizing the emotionalism that church can actually be. So around 2013, I had been, around 2013, I had been kicked out. Um, of being a youth sponsor. So essentially in my church, what a youth sponsor was, was you essentially like aged out of being in the youth around 17, 18 when you graduated high school. And so you could either go to an adult class on a Wednesday night or you could become a youth sponsor. So I have all, I've said this in, in some videos before, but I've always had a heart for youth. I've always had a heart for younger, younger girls, younger women, not, you know, older, whatever. I, for some reason, I've always had a soft spot. So I always wanted to be a youth sponsor because I could still um, minister to them at like church camp, which I always loved going to. I loved, um, I loved working in the gym at youth camp, at church camp, hated going to kids camp because that was a disaster. But that was just where my happy place was. And I was also playing on the praise team. That was an older teen thing that you were able to do. And so I had been on the praise team for a very long time. So I had been kicked out of being a youth sponsor the first time. And I finally was coming back. I noticed when I came back the first time after being kicked out, I noticed, I just noticed more things. So I noticed, um, there was one older youth sponsor. We were all getting spiritually ready. We were getting our hearts ready for church camp. And one of the girls said, hey, remember, she's about 10 years older than me. And she was like, remember that every single night you're going to feel more of God when you're up at the front. So given you kind of how our church camp worked. It was a big, big tabernacle. And like I've said before, I was raised in a Pentecostal Assemblies of God household church where speaking in <laughs> speaking in tongues around, sorry, running around the church was usual. And during church, well, during worship rather, there would hardly be people sitting in their seats. Everybody would be up at the front just like a concert. And so she was saying, like, at the end of the uh, church service, they always gave an altar call because, duh. And if you need to be up there, you need to be the last one up there because um, that's, where, that's where God is, essentially. And I, as soon as she said that, I was like, that ain't right. Like, that's not biblical at all. You don't have to get out of your seat to experience God. You don't have to go anywhere to experience God. You know what I mean? So that was a huge, like, that's, it didn't sit well with me at all. And so shortly after, shortly after that, I was actually, before church camp, church camp happened, I was actually kicked out again. <laughs> but this was more like a permanent thing. And I actually talked about this 
in a church horror story, I believe. So I'll, I'll link that in the description box below. And when I was getting kicked out, it was actually an ex-boyfriend that I had at the time, but we were still going to the same church. He had texted me and he was like, hey, by the way, a lot of the ladies in the church are talking about you. And me being me, I was like, let them talk. I don't care. Because I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. Because prior to all of this, I, at the time, my best friend, was her designated driver for her bachelorette party. And pastors heard of this and did not like it. And so when I was, and when my ex-boyfriend at that time said, hey, people are talking, I text the youth pastor. And I was like, hey, just letting you know, if you hear anything about me, that's wrong. This is actually what happened. So I thought I was doing something good and going like before he heard anything. And he was like, well, why don't you just come down to the church and we can talk about it, which I lived literally 30 seconds from the church. So I just walked down there. And we sat down, and he, like, berated me on how alcohol is terrible. I was not a good witness. If I was essentially as close to God um, as I stated, I wouldn't have gone into the club. Like, I would have sat outside of the club and waited for my friend to come out. And I was so taken aback, you know. I was, like, taken off guard because I'm like, whoa. Like, I did a good thing here, and I defended. I I was so proud of myself because I defended myself in that moment. And he was like, I honestly don't know what I'm going to do in this situation. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm literally telling you what happened. And, like, I didn't even stay the whole time because at 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 that time... I was on the drum line for the Kansas City Royals, and so we had a a game that next day. So I, like, went to sleep, woke up super early, and I left. So I was like, I don't don't understand, like, what's going on. I did something good. I didn't drink. Not saying, like, that's bad because I drink. Like, I'm just saying, like, at that moment, I wasn't drinking and driving. And I, (laughs) I, I took my best friend, her bachelorette party, like, whatever. And so he did not like it. He said, dude, verbatim, he said alcohol was from the devil. I ended up being kicked out again. And this time I was like, you know what? I, I'm going to have to be, I'm going to have to be done. And what really did it for me was coming back to the deconstruction part. I was, I've said this before many times, I was a music major in college for four years until I I switched. The last thing I had to do was my senior recital. So I have a a lot of experience in in music and I play a lot of instruments. Not to toot my own damn horn, but you know, toot fucking toot. So I told the praise team leaders, you know, Sunday morning, it was pretty big church for a little small town. I was like, hey, if you need somebody to like fill in, for sure, you let me know because I can, I can do whatever. I'll just fill in for you. Because at that time, again, I was on the drum line, so I couldn't be doing that all the, all the time. So I was just, you know, filling, understudy, whatever, that's fine. And the only thing I couldn't do proficiently was play the guitar, but everything else, like, I got. And so I, I remember my dad just, I could tell that he felt for me because we would sit at the very, very back of the church because my dad is, like, head of security in the church. So, we sat in the very, very back, and I shit you not, they went without a drum set player. They went without pianist at some point, and they went without a bass guitarist. And I'm just, because I told the race team leader, I was like, hey, you know, like I said before, I was like, hey, if you need anything, like I got you. Everybody knew my experience with, you know, music. <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, 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 sure, not a problem. Why not? But they, everybody just shut me out. Like, they would have rather sounded like shit and gone without instruments because we had a pretty good praise team like musically a pretty good praise team once once uh, once upon a time like it sounded very professional it sounded very good the quality was there and that just all like went downhill 
and they allow themselves not to have a professional musician help them because because of that. And I tell you, that still hurts my heart and it makes me quite like emotional, it makes me want to cry because like I I'll always hold music close to my heart and so when they didn't even ask me solely because in the eyes of other people, like, I was wrong for being a designated driver. I was so broken. Like, my heart was so, so crushed. And so, in those little moments of the church hurt, I'm like, dude, this they, this ain't it, man. Like, this ain't it. This hurts. And this isn't okay. Like, you can't treat people this way. You can't treat people this way. And from then on out, I was just treated like an outsider until I just stopped going and try to find a different church. And then after that, I just stopped going to church altogether. And so I carried my faith for many years after that. And I was, uh, this was after I was out of that really, really bad relationship, which I've like kind of spoken on here, uh, here and there a little bit. And I went head first into personal development, as one does. <laughs> and while I was in personal development, I realized that a lot of these people who were successful weren't Christians. Because, you know, growing up in the church, the Bible was our personal development. However, if I wanted to read something different, it had to be a biblically based personal development mindset book, whatever. So, when I got into the secular world of reading, I realized that there were so many successful people who were not Christians, and that really confused me because we were taught that in order to be successful, you had to work for the Lord, and you had to do things for the Lord. You had to submit your work to the Lord you know, financially and even physically. And so I remember um, my, my aunt is is very successful. She's a principal, uh, was a principal rather, and she has her own business. And she's very, very Christian, like very Christian right-wing woman. Whoa. And I was over at her house one day and I was really, really trying to just dissect the feelings that I was having. And I wanted to ask her so bad, but I think I got too scared. Like, how are secular people successful? Like, how are people who are not Christian successful? Because, like I was saying, we were taught that if you're successful and you're a and you're not a Christian, then you might be successful financially, but you hate yourself. You can't go to bed at night without wondering if there's something more. Like, you're insecure. You are... Um, there's a hole in your heart, like, you know, all of these, all of these things, like your, your family is falling apart, um, you know, God's not in the center of it, all these different negative things, like you might have the money, but everything else sucks. So a few years after that, that was when I moved out of my small Missouri town and moved here to Texas, and I started thinking for myself and fell into... <laughs> spirituality like the energy energy stuff law of attraction manifestation like all of it now do I believe a hundred percent in all that like I used to no not not to the extent but I I can understand why it's important and, but the thing is too like when I was going into spirituality I was still labeling myself as a Christian and I noticed such a similarity between law of attraction, between energy and God, the universe, you know, thinking good things and having good things happen to you and the mindset with all of that. And I began seeing God as something different. And I realized that what was in the Bible was similar to what I was being taught in the spiritual world about energy. And they're just, they're honestly, they're just called different things between spirituality and and Christianity. So, for example, prayer and manifestation, literally the same thing. So, when people are like, I pray, I don't manifest, I'm like, literally, this is the same thing. Like, believing, like, it's in the scripture. We talked about it before a long time ago, but whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it shall be yours. That's manifesting. Now, 
side note, do I completely believe that you can just sit on your ass, believe good things are going to happen? No. The work part is what a lot of people don't, like, like, don't believe. Like, I don't want to say don't believe in, but that's the part where people don't talk about that the most is the working part. Like, you got to do something. You can't just sit on your ass and, like, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's not going to work. Like, you got to do shit. So, I believe in manifestation to a certain extent. Sometimes it's like, mm, you didn't manifest that bad thing happening to you. That's just life, ma'am. You know, sometimes life sucks, but whatever. We That's a whole other subject for a different day. One great, though I don't, you know, super believe in every spiritual thing. Like, it doesn't rule my life like it used to. One really, really solid thing that really started turning around into like my actual deconstruction journey all of this was like preface to what's like the movement of me not being a christian is the spirituality world i was finally being taught and finally believing that i was a good worthy and deserving person which is a very very foreign thing to fundamentalist Christianity because you are taught, Jesus, you are taught that you are innately unworthy and undeserving because Jesus died for, because Jesus died for you, that's what makes you worthy. And then if you don't have Jesus, then you are unworthy. And the desires of your heart, the things that you want to do, those are all sinful things because you don't listen to your own heart. You have to ask for the desires of God, you know, God's will, and then whatever that is, that's what you do instead of like, hey, I really want to do fill in the blank because it's a desire of my own heart. That That is flesh. That is your flesh. You don't want to do things out of the will of, out of the will of God. Uh, things of that nature. So your innate intuitive feeling is wrong. So when I began learning about like, I am worthy. I, 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 like I do belong. I am worthy of love. I am deserving. What I began learning began serving me and making sense that I am valuable a whole person and I am loved simply, simply because I was born and nothing else, nothing else mattered. Like, nothing, nobody had to do anything for me to be worthy, for me to be a whole person, for me to be valuable, which began crumbling, inevitably, which began crumbling my belief in Jesus. And I also remember the time where it started to fully <laughs> fully crumble. I was actually walking my dog and the thought just came to me that, hey, since I believe that I'm truly innately worthy, that I was born worthy, like, do I believe in Jesus? Because Jesus died for us to no longer be sinners, no longer be disgusting, no longer you know, it, he he died for us so we could be saved, so we could be worthy and deserving and all of these things. So when I was on that walk, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> if I already believe that I am innately worthy and I'm innately valuable and deserving, where does that put Jesus? And so that, that point is when it really like, oh shit. I don't think he... I don't think he died for me. And then that moment I was like, wait a second, died? His dad was going to perform a human sacrifice? So that that logistic part, the logical part in my brain was like, oh my God. Because I, you know, like normal women do, I love true crime and I love learn to learn about cults and stuff. And so whenever we hear about you know, human sacrifice, you know, uh, animal sacrifice, whatever. It's like, mm, that's super weird. <laughs> like, and stay away from that. And so when I thought about Christianity, logically, I was like, bro, 
we are in a religion that believes in human sacrifice. Like, that's what the foundation is. And that really rocked me because I then had an identity crisis because your identity is in Jesus Christ. Like, when you are a Christian, my lips are so chapped. When you are a Christian, your identity is in Jesus Christ. So when I was on that walk, I didn't understand where my identity was in. But in that moment, I was so thankful that I had done so much work on myself because it wasn't because it wasn't a long identity crisis because because I was like, no, that's on me. Like, now I get to trust in me. Now I get to trust in my intuition. Now I get to do what I want to do instead of checking with somebody before I did it. And so the big, big, big epiphany was... So I had already wanted to write a book <laughs> about something, um, but I didn't know what it was. So I was like, okay, I'm going to be a future author. I don't know what I'm going to write about, but it's going to be a thing. And so... I started, I was in the, in my living room and I was just kind of walking around because I wanted to create a course for Christian women, okay? I wanted to create a course because during my spirituality shit, I was doing online courses because I thought that's where my entrepreneurial um, journey was going and that is not it. It was, that's a whole other topic. So I was in the personal development, spirituality, life coaching circle. If that tells you anything, blah, any hoodle. So I was trying to develop a course on Christianity and ladies and, and a Christian lady's body. So I was standing there and I tell you, I was so what Brittany Dawn and Jordan Nelson like to say, so wrecked. It wrecked me. <laughs> it wrecked me because my thought was, why are so many Christian women, which this has been my question before, why are so many Christian women, more Christian women than secular women, so much more insecure with their bodies than secular women? And I sat there for a second and I was like, that doesn't make sense to me because, you know, when you're in Christ, you're supposed to be in the freedom of Christ. You're supposed to be um, loving the life that you're in. You know, you you don't have um, the same battles as secular women and, you know, you give yourself to God, whatever, whatever. So you're supposed to be living in this whole freedom facade when you're a Christian, but why are so many Christian women specifically so insecure with their bodies more so than secular women. And I sat there and it just, it just hit me. And the epiphany was, we are so much more insecure than Christian women are so much more insecure with their bodies because we were taught that covering up equals good and showing bodies off equals bad. And I tell you, dude, like as soon as that came in my brain, every memory of my mom saying, you need to cover up your body because you're going to make an, uh, you're going to make a boy want to, you know, make a boy have dirty thoughts about you. Like you need to wear baggier shirts because my boobs are, are naturally big. So she would say, you need to wear bigger shirts and no logo on the front of the shirt because you're going to draw attention to your boobs. And it was so, you have to cover your body, you have to cover your body. And so, of course, that makes a woman insecure. And so, from that, I was like, oh my God, dude, what is happening? There are so many, and this is when I, I finally was like, this is my book. Or, and that's what I have in my, um, my intro these are false beliefs taught to women inside the church where we are supposed to be in freedom. We are supposed to be trusting the people around us. We are supposed to be consuming all the good word, you know, the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus, when in all reality, women are being fed these false beliefs, this misinformation and to be honest, that's exactly where just the snowball effect, like just, just started. And then I stumbled upon 
um, the deconstruction people on Instagram. And then that's when I was like, I have to start a YouTube channel. And my book is going to be about the false beliefs taught to women inside the church and my deconstruction journey. And so my first video was like, hey, I'm, you know, coming here to tell you about the false beliefs taught to women inside the church and to keep you updated on my book, which I haven't done. Um, I've been writing, but I haven't been like keep, keeping up with it. Well, like y'all keep up with it. So that is a nutshell of where my deconstruction journey went. And I, you know, I kind of just like of the life coaching and spirituality and things, but I now can see how everything had a time and place in my life. Now, when I get into something, I like dive right into it. And I think that's a toxic trait of mine, I think, because um, when I got into spirituality, you know, that was after, um, that was during and kind of after I realized like, oh my God, like I'm not really uh, like a actual Christian anymore. I would make it my life. So I would try to read people's energies and I would be like, mm, you need to clear your throat chakra. You know what I mean? Like why all those things. But I also realize now it had to play a part in my life in that moment. And the life coaching aspect of it, that helped me to ask myself questions. So that, again, dove right, <laughs> dove right into that. You know, that's a whole other subject of the life coaching industry. And I got super sucked into it. But that also allowed me to, n n with no shame, ask myself questions of, okay, so if I wasn't allowed to wear this, like, in the church, like, what did that, what did that look like for me? So I, I definitely was able to open up more to myself and ask questions without shame or guilt or whatever. So I can understand where all of those things had a place in my life, but at the same time, I, that's not where I, <laughs> that's not where I go now. So let me know what your thoughts are down below. I would love to, I would love to hear your deconstruction journey, and I would also love to hear your church horror stories. So I'll leave a link in the description box below. You can use the same link to give me your de deconstruction journey. I would love to hear it. And I would love to read your church horror story so I can put it in a video here very soon. And if you have any questions over your deconstruction journey, over mine, over just generic things, I would greatly um, appreciate your your comment down below, and I will do my very very best to answer it to my to the best of my ability. So, I always remember that you're a fierce and powerful motherfucking woman, and I appreciate you so very much. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.